Uh, it is recording. I mean, you can start to share your screen. Uh, and for you that don't know Amu, um, he'll, he'll introduce himself. Uh, but he is going to be speaking to us uh, about migrating from serverless framework to the CDK as of this evening. Uh, thank you very much, Amu. Um, you can take it away. We can see your screen. Thank you, man. Cool. Thanks. <clears throat> hey, everybody. Welcome along. Super pleased to be here again and walk you guys through how um, Triplo migrated away from the serverless framework all the way to the CDK. So yeah, as uh, Rian said, I, my name is Amo. I'm currently the engineering manager at uh, Triplo. Primarily, I'm a JavaScript engineer. And if you're interested at all, you can find me on Twitter or GitHub at hashtag, oh, sorry, my, uh, my Twitter handle is Prince Ashburton. And on GitHub, it's Amor Dino. So cool. Uh, let's just jump straight in. So uh, to paint a bit of context, back in 2019, I joined uh, Triplo. So this was like very pre-pandemic when interest rates were still extremely low and like there was no such thing as a pandemic. And then before the pandemic hit, we had uh, opted to, well, not opted, we had embarked on the journey of uh, creating uh, like a Swiss knife for transporters in the logistics industry. And the way we did that was by creating a tool called MyFleet. So essentially, MyFleet is a product that allows transporters to manage their, tuck, their trucks, trailers, and drivers, as well as see like when permits are going to expire or uh, driver's licenses. So however, as we started um, taking this particular product to market, we kind of realized that our we, we struggled to find a bit of product market fit. And then the pandemic hit, so we also had to pivot uh, the business a bit. So we came up with a product which we coined, like at the time, the Uberization of Road Freight, which is our loads marketplace, which essentially just is a tool that allows any cargo owner or broker to be able to pay to be paired with a transporter to be able to move their loads. So like everything in our world needs uh, logistics from the shirts that we wear, from the shoes, the food uh, that we eat. So uh, the way most of the logistics in South Africa, particularly or Africa happens is people actually, uh, uh, rather cargo owners and brokers send transporters an email or WhatsApp to actually be notified or to be asked if they can actually move a particular load. And some companies do loads like in the hundreds or thousands. And at the end of the month, it's very hard for logistics companies to figure out like how much have, how, how many tons of a particular commodity have they actually shipped to be able to share paperwork for a particular load like border documents or uh, PODs. So uh, this particular tool, Loads Marketplace, in, um, encompasses that. So however, we couldn't have stopped there because our customers started asking us like, okay, cool, it's nice that I can organize uh, all my loads in one place. I don't have to send WhatsApps or emails to transporters anymore. But what would be really dope is that if I could be able to see where a particular load is at any point in time on the map. So I scrambled around uh, uh, over a course of the weekend and spun together this um, feature called Loads Tracking which does what it says on the tin, which helps uh, cargo owners and transporters track their loads in real time. So what we did here simply was we uh, hooked up into the telemetry unit of the truck, and then we simply just published the, uh, we published the location into one of our services. And then when the user signs into the application, all they're doing is just basically seeing exactly where uh, a truck is at any given point in time. And then we do a couple of things like calculate the distance completed and then also the, the progress or the duration of the of that particular trip. So like you might be wondering, was that like a sales pitch for Triplo? Kind of yes, maybe no, but it was, I felt like that um, that whole business story was important to give you guys a bit of context into, you know, like, why Triplo chose the technological stack or the tech stack rather that we um, that we've adopted. So I'm going to hit. I'm going to cover a bit of our philosophy, the categories or the different tools that we're using on AWS, as well as some of the patterns that we're employing as well. So first off, like I said, uh, Triplo was founded in 2019. So in 2019, serverless was like you know the hype was as big as not as big as what AI is at the moment. But it was fairly big where you had banks and enterprises all scrambling to understand, you know, like what are the cost savings and what are the benefits 
for our business in terms of adopting serverless as a technology. So we pretty much followed suit and we went all in on serverless and we were f and we are still fully powered by AWS. And some of the tools that we use on AWS are your familiar suspects like Lambda for all of our API and compute needs and then S3 for storing uh, uh, objects or blob, uh, so like would be images, videos, documents, etc. Then we use Cognito for our user management. So yeah, Co Cognito is quite a contentious tool within our within our team because it's just like it's reliable some days and then it's not reliable other days but then also it just lacks like basic functionality of being able to like you know port a whole bunch of users into like a different account so what we actually funny enough ended up doing was rolling out like our own sso uh, application built on top of cognito and then also we use dynamo db for all of our storage needs as a, as a database. And then we've got uh, EventBridge uh, that's used out throughout our application that we use for communicating between different services while we use SQS, uh, Amazon Simple Q service for intra-service communication. And then we've got SNS that allows us to fan out messages via SMS or, or email. And then we've got AWS's location service that powers uh, the loads tracking um, feature that I just showed you previously before we were using year.com. And then on the analytics side, uh, we use Athena uh, coupled with Glue as our data layer. And then we use Kinesis Firehose that uh, gets all the data from our application layer and then spreads it across like Athena and the Glue, uh, sorry, Athena and Glue on our data layer. And then we use QuickSight to basically surface all the data from Athena to give that information to our users as reporting. And then we use OpenSearch as our transient search database to search all the records that are inside uh, DynamoDB. Then on the client side, we use React and React Native, and then we sprinkle we sprinkle we sprinkle it along with a bit of TypeScript and JavaScript all over the place. So that's uh, a run through through all the tools that we're currently using. Now onto the patterns. So uh, in logistics, like I mean, you guys also experience it. If you have, if you've had anything delivered to your doorstep, usually there's a driver there with like a little pad that that, that asks you to to sign. And then after they after you've signed uh, that little pad, you usually get sent an email with a document which represents a proof of delivery or POD. So in our case, it's exactly the same. So once a transporter has actually delivered the load to a particular customer, they then need to come into our application and upload, the doc, upload that POD. So that POD is uploaded to an S3 bucket. So once that S3 bucket has been uh, or receives um, an object, it then triggers an event to a Lambda function, which then has the Lambda function write directly to DynamoDB. So the reason why we need to do that is because we also need to signify on our end to know once a load has been completed or we'd like to change the particular state or status of, uh, of a particular load. So this pattern helps, uh, helps us very nicely to achieve uh, those type of uh, use cases within our business. And then secondly, we've got SQS to SES. So like I mentioned earlier, we use SQS to communicate in between uh, different funk or, or sorry, within a particular service. So in a particular case, like let's say uh, a customer has created the load saying they want to take it from Centurion to Cape Town. Uh, what we also do is we have a process that fires that particular payload or that information about the request for the load into an SQS queue, which is then, which then sorry, triggers a separate Lambda function, which then sends uh, that payload uh, via SES to send out an email to say, hey, uh, this particular user has created a particular load. So we send that email out to ourselves uh, internally for the operations team, as well as the cargo owner and the transporter to be aware that, hey, there's actually a forthcoming load that um, they need to pick up and deliver. And then lastly, which we like very much is um, using the location service with EventBridge to Lambda. So what's quite cool about uh, AWS's location service is that it's built into EventBridge as well. So we use it quite frequently when uh, geofences need to be triggered. So if a particular truck uh, reaches a geofence, then the location service automatically sends that event to EventBridge and we're able to capture that within our load tracking service into a Lambda and do whatever we need to do with that information. So either again, we can update a record or send out an email or uh, do whatever we please with that particular payload from that um, event. 
Cool. So, I mean, it's all cool having all these nice tools and AWS and all these cool patterns. However, we're doing all of this at the same time while trying to move at the speed of light. We've introduced quite a few problems. So number one, number one problem that we had was just the gen overall developer experience of actually working on a particular sets of requirements locally. Uh, what we have here is we have just basically an invocation of a function uh, locally. So I know you're probably thinking that these clowns could have probably used uh, Postman, which you are right. But uh, to get the data in a particular format, as you can see in the code snippet at the bottom, you have to take this entire payload and then also escape it into JSON and then uh, invoke invoke the function. So this got very difficult to replicate across multiple developers. Uh, well, I wouldn't say their environments, but rather their workflows where everybody would keep coming back and saying, oh, this is not matching what's in the spec in the Jira ticket or whatever the case might be. And majority of the time, this was the force of uh, the problem, the way we mocked up our functions. And then next up, uh, there was some click ops done uh, to uh, scaffold some infrastructure here. So as you can see with the arrows, some of the, the API gateway resources, as well as some of the DynamoDB tables were made by other developers that decided to do it inside uh, inside the, uh, the AWS console. So it made it very difficult to reference this particular information, uh, sorry, these particular resources in any of the new services that we would spawn, uh, that would need to spawn up as well. And if ever the business requirement came out that we'd need to deploy our put all our backend infrastructure inside or into another region for whatever reason, we would just struggle to do it and would have to recreate all this infrastructure and then migrate it over to our new uh, infrastructure. So yeah, ClickOps was a, a big, big, big issue uh, at the start of um, us scaffolding most of our infrastructure. And then also, um, yeah, I feel really ashamed for actually showing you guys this, however. But as you can see here, I've got different routes that come from API Gateway. So majority of these routes uh, also represent um, different repositories. So we had a big polyglot uh, repo approach going on that caused quite a few outages because like if you would ship features in uh, or changes in like let's say service A and then service B might need to rely on these new changes and it's like a Thursday and you've got to go you've got to be somewhere in, uh, in the evening or the afternoon and you forget to deploy service B and then boom you've caused like an outage so this was like a massive problem which we needed to address so now you know we sort of came to a roundabout of like you know what are really our options so our option a was to like stick with the serverless framework and then address the polyglot repo approach by refactoring everything into one repo and then also using local stack which basically is a giant docker image that recreates all of aws's infrastructure so you can use it uh, you can use it locally and then also invest in learning their new console solution that they've uh, that they released, I think, at the start of 2020. Uh, next up was to use the AWS CDK flat out, which would allow us to adopt infrastructure as code. And it would also allow us to write test against our infrastructure. And then you could we could easily recreate cloud formation in our language of choice. So we were going to go for the AWS uh, CDK option, which we kind of did but there was just something missing from the sense that, you know, like it's still not going, we, we still weren't convinced that it was going to improve the local developer experience. So we came across a tool called SST made by the guys at Anomaly uh, Innovations out in San Francisco. They run a, CD, a CICD pipeline a tool called, um, called Seed. And essentially what SST is, it's a TypeScript construct built on top of the S, uh, uh, CDK. And the big difference is that it sets up a WebSocket connection to your actual AWS infrastructure um, uh, that you have. So the whole premise is hopefully that, you know, each, organiz each organization that uses AWS for every environment, whether it be production, staging and development, that you have to have like a separate account which has or which must have like separate logins or login credentials for each account and not just one root account that's got three uh, separate environments. So essentially how we've improved our developer workflow at the moment is every developer has their own local environment that they're able to spin up resources 
as they please and they can bomb whatever they want to bomb without polluting like our dev and staging and production environments. So like I said, we had a whole bunch of polygot repos everywhere. We had like a, re a really weak uh, interpretation of microservices happening. So what we had to do was find a way to obviously migrate all these, uh, this giant spider web of all these services uh, effectively. So some of the key pattern or key learnings rather that uh, I picked up was uh, what's very important is you've got to decide whether if you move if you're migrating a particular service you've got to decide very early on whether you're going to copy the existing uh, patterns that um, your that service is um, basically using at that point in time so um, the reason why I say that is because uh, the one service that was made for our organization service had like a giant um, a while loop and what that while loop was basically doing was was basically cycling through all our organizations trying to find a particular a particular user but like if you're not aware that or if you've forgotten or you're not aware that that particular pattern uh, is or approach is being done in a particular service you've got to like let uh, the business know and you've got to let whoever is like the project manager know that hey i'm not only just migrating a particular service to a different framework but i'm also going to start changing the internal logic which is obviously going to increase the the length of time that you spent on a particular project and then also what's very key is you need to also from the get-go try to replicate the existing workloads that you have in production to obviously make sure that uh, the work that you're doing locally once it goes out into production doesn't crumble based on the uh, the throughput from your data. So with us, uh, what happened is there was a uh, there was a function that we 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 didn't do what, I, what I'm basically saying, and essentially uh, we hit a lambda a lambda limit purely because we were testing the we were testing the new service that we migrated over with a very small data set compared to what's actually happening in production. Cool, and then. Uh, thirdly, uh, like I showed you, there was a giant spider web, so there were lots of interdependent uh, services. So some services might need to be shut down due to your uh, uh, migration because you might be changing uh, the data source. So if you are going to do that, you just need to identify that uh, beforehand, have a chat with the operations, sales and marketing team to whatever to be able to let them know that, hey, we're basically migrating things for you know to make the world a better place so just um is it possible if a particular service might be down so you could stop marketing or sell or selling that particular uh, particular feature to existing and future future customers cool so what i'm going to do here is just go through a bit of a code comparison so i hope you guys could see um the text editor nicely so what i've got here is basically an s3 bucket uh, written in yaml to uh, for um, for the serverless framework to be able to uh, create um, this bucket in cloud formation. So as you can see, about 48 lines worth of YAML. Compared, if we compare this to what we're doing now in the CDK, we've got about like 19 lines of of of, of TypeScript that where we can uh, basically spawn up. Uh, uh, S3 buckets, and also the benefit is that we can also control the way we want to name. Uh, the man in uh, which we want to name S3 buckets and we can do it dynamically uh, as well and it's written in our runtime of course as well. So another comparison here is our DynamoDB table. So yeah, 19 lines of uh, 19 lines of code in YAML and you know you've got to worry about uh, making sure the, indent uh, the indentation is correct versus writing this out in TypeScript. And then like like I said again, we can now dynamically create uh, the fields and the GSIs and the sort keys and all that kind of jazz dynamically if we if we ever need, uh, have the, the need to. Cool, so probably wondering, are all of our problems solved? And the answer is, I, I'd like to phrase it rather like, I should, I should have rather phrased this question, rather is like, is our developer experience, are, are the issues around our developer experience solved? And the answer is most definitely yes. So the beautiful thing about SST, while we opted for it, like I said, it, it creates a WebSocket connection against your local um, AWS account. So it, it brings up this lovely uh, terminal for you, where basically, as you can see in the left hand pane, you've got like stacks, functions, the API, DynamoDB tables, RDS buckets, and 
and, and your Cognito user pools. So you can interact with all those services directly um, in the console if you need to as well. As well, so here we've got uh, a DynamoDB table. So like if you're trying to test a particular edge case or whatever, you can directly go uh, locally. So this will spawn up like on uh, localhost 3000. So what you'll have over here is basically you'll be able to edit a particular record or multiple records to test whatever um, edge case you're trying to solve um, for your particular requirement as well. And then you can run the scans, you can run the, the GSIs, and then you can look at all the tables inside or um, in, in your infrastructure as well. Uh, cool. So uh, what we have over here is basically the method for how we then uh, recreate um, our resources via infrastructure as code. So SST just has this uh, SST uh, config.ts file where basically you import all the um, all the uh, uh, the stacks that you've created, so whether it be your DynamoDB tables, your Lambda functions, or whatever the case might be, you can easily dump it inside this file. And like I like I mentioned earlier, if the biz, if your uh, your team or your company ever has that requirement to push um, infrastructure into a different region, it's easily possible uh, going uh, doing it this way by infrastructure as code. Cool. And then lastly. Just to wrap up, like what are the benefits of a monorepo is that A, um, we've got all our changes in one place. So this has dramatically reduced uh, the amount of outages that uh, we've caused as well that we cause our customers. And then also we found that the work goes out um, a lot quicker due to the changes being um, in one place. Then also it's also given us the platform to run a feature flag experimentation within the various parts of our services and for various customers as well. So yeah, that brings me to the end of uh, the talk about how you know Triplo migrated fr away from the serverless framework to the CDK. And you know, if you've got any questions, please shoot away. Uh, hey, Amo, I just have a quick question. Eh? So I hey, saw you. Okay, good, how's it? Good, good. Thank you. Good. Sorry, my line is a bit bad, so hopefully you can catch me. But I wanted to ask, so you guys are currently using DynamoDB, so it, it makes sense because that data is pretty much, well, it's still in uh, early stage and stuff, but as the data grows in large numbers, uh, I think it would be wiser to move to like a relational database like RNS. So my question is, uh, how easy would it be to migrate from uh, DynamoDB to a relational database like RDS or Aurora? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So um, that's actually been a big contentious issue within like the entire company, you know, from like the ops teams uh, to sales and as well as the tech team. So unfortunately, at the moment, because um, our, uh, our two of our mains like to migrate everything, we don't have the the amount of resources given. Our goal is to aggressively bring in sales into the business if that makes um if that makes sense so it's going to be like a mammoth uh, under undertaking so but in terms of how we uh, plan to do that we've already started um we've spun up like a, a, a an aurora serverless postgres instance for a new feature that we we're going to release soon so our goal there is to basically just have um like an adapter that for based on the based on the data that's coming into a particular table to just basically write it into the into that Aurora um, instance essentially. So that's like the ideas that are floating around at the moment. But we haven't really uh, what's the word? We haven't. Uh, the, the, another big issue is actually that we had with Athena is actually making our data model correct because with our DynamoDB tables, people were just throwing like all kinds of data in there. And then also like, I mean, you've got like arrays in objects. We've got um, someone decide, uh, a while back, someone just a uh, previous engineer decided to store all of our users in um, a key value pair. So like all of our users are, are like stored inside objects instead of an array as well. So, you know, we've got those type of things to contend with and to think about. So to answer your question, I don't really know yet, but what we are working on at the moment is making sure we've got, uh, sustainable um, ERD or schema for our relational database and make sure that we are able to uh, map everything that's in NoSQL all the way into SQL. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, cool. Makes a lot of sense. Just a side note, it sounds like a lot of like 
a lot of stuff needs to like you guys need to clean the data so it'd be interesting in the next meetup to find out if you, if you guys have figured out like how to do some etl stuff so it may be a oh, conversation yeah. for actually interesting you say that so that's actually going to be the my next blog talk or whatever oh. which i'm currently working on so we made a um our data layer like i said it's in athena and glue so we we came up with like an interesting solution to get the data out of DynamoDB and into into athena so yeah definitely you guys will all know once i've made the post and i'll probably talk about it somewhere okay cool shots thanks man cool thanks uh just before we continue Whoa. um like i shared a link in the chat um and that is the link to the short survey um if you if you complete it um like that to entry for the lucky draw that will do like right after this um to see who wins some LLS credits um okay sorry um, um john I quick think question from, yeah uh quick question from us following the the question from still so he said it's easier to just move from um well it would be preferable from to move from dynamo to um relational database isn't it better instead of just moving to basically um put a um strongly tied layer on top of dynamo db so that whatever data whatever um data type that you you that goes in there it's, it's still protected in a way but it's still a bit more work but isn't it easier that way instead of just migrating to a different database which needs a lot of resources and and all that stuff i don't know i don't know. i came a bit late so i'm um yeah yeah oh uh, hey sean uh no 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 problem uh i just want to go back to one slide quickly just to hop on to your question so i can just visually represent what i want to get across to you Cool. Can you see my screen? Oh, I mean, can you see the slide, right? So over here, we've got all these loads over here. So, oh. so like, let's take the first uh, load in this line over here. So, like, imagine like a, um, a product designer comes and makes like a new feature, saying, "Hey, wouldn't it be cool if um, customers are able to know, um, like, you know, how many times a particular truck in in these group of loads?" traveled between Johannesburg and Cape Town with uh, using that 34-ton uh, uh, tort liner vehicle configuration. So, sure, man, it, 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 doing that in DynamoDB, geez, it would be a nightmare. I don't think anybody in the team would be able to have like a free weekend, at least for like a month. So yeah. uh, obviously doing that in SQL, that's, that's less than 30 minutes worth of work, especially with ChatGPT, you know? So mm -hmm. um, essentially to answer your question, that's probably why we wouldn't want to uh, stay with uh, with DynamoDB in that uh, particular instance. And then, I mean, and then to, on, uh, to actually support like your initial claim, we could just chuck on a whole bunch of GSIs or onto yeah. that, but there is actually a limit to the amount of GSIs you can. I can't remember the number that you can have on a particular table. So, but then also, like you know, your scheme is always going to uh, uh, change dynamically based on the needs of the business as well. So, I mean, SQL is just that you know, it's it's like, I mean, I think it's been around since the seventies or maybe longer. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. it's always going to have your back in terms of when people get creative in terms of like what customers want to see, but then also what business wants to see at like operational level to help uh, to make uh, data-driven decisions. Okay, no, it makes sense, it makes sense. Cool, 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 thanks, man. Uh, Joshua, you have a hand and then I'll answer Darren's question afterwards as well. Cool, thanks. Hi, uh, this is very cool, so thanks for sharing, really appreciate it. Um, SST is very cool as in with the solution that it provides you. So I like how you guys are using that. My question is just, so the other services that you've shown in that first slide where you kind of show the different AWS services that you use in your architecture, mm -hmm. the searching and the glue, um, have you also kind of implemented that with an infrastructure as code approach? And are you using CK for that? Or what are you using to kind of automate that and test that? So we're using a combination of the CDK and uh, SST as well. 
So um, SST doesn't have helpers for uh, Glue and Athena. So we're just importing uh, the SST helpers to base, sorry, the CDK helpers to generate that infrastructure. And then we're still using uh, SST to basically help us create that uh, create that um, infrastructure. And then uh, actually just to add on that, so the uh, one of the, some of the drawbacks with uh, SST is that uh, a, they're deciding to move away from using the the CDK as a as like a basis for uh, spawning everything up, and they want to they're using uh, they're going to move to Plumi and uh, Terraform, I think. So uh, the issue that that presents is that they uh, they're going to stop support for a particular uh, CDK version in the future. So we we'll, we we'll also be robbed of all the benefits that AWS bring about or introduce with the latest version of the of the CDK. But anyway, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And then just, just following up on that, do you find that they play well together, kind of using SST with its add-ons to make some things easier and then just the stuff it doesn't support just using CDK? Do you find that that works well? Is there some issues that you think like encountered with that approach? With the uh, uh, no, 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 we haven't encountered any. Uh, it, the only issue, like, like I said, is just like, um, SST only supports the, CD, uh, the CDK to a certain point. So after that, then, uh, so to give you an example, when we were trying to spin up um, uh, this Postgres cluster, they introduced the data API version two, which obviously the data version, uh, the data API V2 helps uh, you, uh, it, AWS obfuscates the ability for you to uh, worry about uh, the reader and writer nodes, but that's only available on a higher version of the CDK. So we had to use uh, the data API version one, where we stuck uh, trying to, uh, not trying to figure out rather, but trying to manage and maintain uh, the read and writer nodes for that uh, cluster. So like in those, in those like uh, niche use cases, that's where you might find uh, some, some issues. But obviously I think that's why the SST team decided to um, move away from using the CDK as its primary source for um, allowing you to create uh, infrastructure outside of it just being exclusive to AWS, but allowing developers to use Azure or uh, GCP. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, cool, so I'm just gonna tackle Darren's question here quickly. So do you guys consider any forms of infrastructure as code and what made you guys decide not to go with them? Okay, cool, so to put this question, in, uh, to answer this question in a nutshell, the main reason we did consider, uh, we only con we did look at uh, Terraform and we did look at just using uh, the CDK on its own, but however, the benefits with what SST make uh, provide us with um, the developer experience with that console that I showed you earlier, that was the primary driver for why we opted to um, uh, to go with SST and not anything else. And then any cool applications of using Elasticsearch and Kinesis in your services? Yes, so um, in logistics, so like imagine, uh, uh, so uh, one of the, okay, let me, let me put this in English rather. So uh, Roads Food Group, they're one of our customers, right? So they have about over 20 different uh, transporters. Wow. And what used to happen is that each transporter every single month would have to send them an Excel spreadsheet of the rates that they want, that they do for a particular routes. So that particular route could be from uh, Fruit Drakenstein to uh, somewhere in Cape Town or Fruit Drakenstein to Centurion all over the country and then also in Lesotho as well. So what, it, what, what would have to happen is that they would have to have uh, someone on their team uh, collect all those spreadsheets on a monthly basis from like 20 different transporters and then combine it into like one master matrix as they, as they called it. So what we do with uh, Elastics, uh, sorry, with Open Search um, or Elastic Search, is that we take all we uh, we dump all of those spreadsheets into an S3 bucket, and then we write it to um, uh, to a cluster in Open Search, which obviously allows us to get like lightning quick uh, results and make really intricate fuzzy uh, fuzzy search type queries to be able to um, get a match on a particular route based on the transporter's uh, price as well. So that's how we're using um, Elasticsearch at the moment. And then with uh, Kinesis, 
is essentially when um, uh, we were using Kinesis to export the data out of uh, DynamoDB, but then they, uh, before the December break, they released the point in time recovery uh, feature where basically we have a cron job that hits a particular table and that point in time recovery job uh, executes, which then dumps it into Dyn uh, sorry into an S3 bucket, and then starts our whole um, uh, our whole uh, ETL uh, process. So the reason why we stopped using kin uh, Kinesis was just because of the price, and we uh, and um, the price comparison to compared to the point in time recovery mechanism built natively inside DynamoDB just made a lot more sense. Cool, Darren. I hope that answers your questions. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Estian, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hey, Amo, uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, I just had a question regarding what you mentioned for the, where you were using, every developer was using their own account for developing or testing their, their code. I was just wondering if there's any risks um, that you've encountered or experienced, I guess, <laughs> where, um, because I mean, obviously these developers would have like admin access in their own account and they could potentially, for example, spin up a open search cluster accidentally, stuff like that. Um, I was just wondering if that's usually an issue or you're small enough where it doesn't really come up. Everyone's responsible enough because I guess it's a lot of power. <laughs> and I would imagine the, the all, the, they're all under one organization. So every developer, they don't pay for them. It's not in their <laughs> own name, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, no, you're 100 percent correct. So uh, our CTO Nathan, he watches that. He watches the bull like a hawk. Um, so essentially, uh, we uh, and and also we're small enough. So I only manage a team of about like five developers. So essentially, we're small enough to be able to pick up if someone's spinning up like um, a weird instance. But also, we've just got like a good enough trust that uh, people ask if they want to like experiment with something outside of like the core um tools that i that I've, that I've chucked on the slide here so generally we don't have that problem yet but i mean down the line obviously uh, the easy solution would just be to look into having a lot more uh, stricter im permissions okay great that makes sense thanks awesome loric Oh cool, yeah. Um, just uh, you, you've led me into another question are you using aws organizations to Manage multiple accounts. Uh, correct. Yeah, we yeah. are. Yeah. And have you explored using uh, SCPs and things like that um, to limit what is actually possible to do in those accounts? So uh, use what? Sorry. Uh, service control policies. Oh, service control. Oh, to be honest, I'm not going to lie. I'm not sure what the service control policy is. Uh, we just use the IM or uh, like the IM, basically, yeah. well, in the code as well to limit uh, to for policy generation, essentially. Okay, yeah. Uh, SCP is just essentially a possible uh, a policy that you can put against an entire AWS account that is used to kind of set up guardrails. So you can, for example, say um, users are not allowed to create IAM resources at all, um, or they're not allowed to deploy anything uh, inside regions other than, say, AF South 1 and EU West 1. Or okay. uh, they can spin up EC2 instances as long as it's uh, of type smaller than uh, smaller than a medium. Or or say only the subset of EC2 instances or uh, types are allowed to be deployed. Okay. And so on. Yeah. Uh, this is. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just saying it's just something that we found quite useful. Okay. Uh, in that type of. I just wanted to know, like how, like you mentioned, you could like make granular permissions based on the EC2 uh, uh, cluster types or whatever, or instance types rather. How is it different from the other granular permissions that you can set within an IAM role policy? The, the difference is you can, so within an organization's uh, hierarchy, you can apply it to organization units, and okay. which then applies this to multiple accounts. Whereas if you're doing IAM strictly speaking, Mm -hmm. um, you either have to manage it in each account individually, or if you're using something like AWS single sign-on to allow for, or what's it now called, identity center, to mm -hmm. manage permissions across multiple accounts, then you need to specifically imply it against every user that has access to that account. 
Okay. Right. So, so whereas an SAP kind of just can be applied to an organization unit, which can be, which will then infer its policy on every account within that organization unit. So it's sort of one place to manage it. Okay. Now that makes sense. Oh, cool. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. No, excellent. It's just something we found useful. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, thanks. It's been uh, it's an awesome presentation. You also raise your hand. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, how's it, man? Hey, Darren. How's good to you, man. Yeah, good, good, good. Let me put my camera on. <laughs> Just break the sort of uh, you know barriers. Um, really cool um, presentation that you did, and it felt like let me rather just ask it in person. Uh, <laughs> follow suit. I uh, just want to ask, like, in terms of you guys have, uh, you mentioned you guys use like a sort of event driven um, approach towards like solving these problems in um, or challenges in your your so sort of domain. Um, I just want to ask, like, what sort of what sort of challenges have you had with working with it, and where have you found it like kind of useful um, with all your different uh, services? Okay, perfect. Um, the biggest challenge is uh, if you don't have the biggest challenge is audit trails. So, um, like when people do stuff, if you don't have like good audit trails in place, you can't go back to customers and explain why something happened. Uh, like if if someone accidentally uploaded a whole like we had the other day, someone. Someone else accidentally uploaded um, a whole bunch of trucks, trailers, and drivers. It, uh, at, at the time, it looked like they were duplicated, but they were not duplicated because they were like, in what we have different workspaces that you can upload assets in. So that only happened through like a whole process of uh, digging into the data and writing a bit of code. But like, if you don't have like a uh, decent order trailing built into like your entire system. And I think that's the biggest uh, drawback. And then also in addition to that, also uh, re like sort of replaying uh, events and also trying to replay, I'm not talking events specifically in event bridge because you can do that, but I'm just trying to say, well, replay uh, when you when an event started and the payload and then trying to mirror that to a particular issue that the customers faced with the logs as well. That you uh, that you that you've gone. So I think the biggest issue for me has just been trying to troubleshoot something, and then get getting the correct logs, and then trying to start something uh, all over again. Um, and then in terms of the uh, uh, the biggest uh, benefit is that like we not we not like people can enjoy their weekend, so we're not stressing about. Um, uh, about clusters and all that kind of jazz, but I mean, we but but also we're fortunate enough that the problem space doesn't doesn't demand that outside of uh, our tracking related uh, use cases. So I think for me that's like the biggest um, uh, the biggest win outside everything. And then also it, it's almost like uh, it's almost like using React on the front end, but on the back end in the sense that like they're just giant Lego pieces that you can just play together and connect things with other AWS services similar to what we did with the location service because we you were really using EventBridge then it just needs like an existing um, EventBridge uh, uh, ID or whatever we uh, that we're using exactly to get like uh, get like started. So that's like predominantly the main. Uh, benefits that we that we see using the like an event driven uh, architecture as well. That's cool. Just uh, may I ask, um, in terms of your API gateway, were those integrating with like um, lambdas only, or did you guys have um, like separate I don't know containers or whatever? Uh, no, those were exclusively interfacing with um, with our lambdas, and then obviously hidden behind um, a JWT uh, token for uh, via Cognito, or oh, sorry, a Cognito authorizer, as in oh, okay. the Cognito user pools as an authorizer. Yeah, essentially. Okay, so it was like mainly like a large serverless stack, uh, besides serverless framework. Yeah, correct. Oh, yeah, and also we've got to add in also most of our all of our um, things in API Gateway are behind um, 
Route 53 for domain. So we've basically got our company subdomain with API essentially to get that instead of just getting that those ugly um, uh, custom URLs from uh, from Lambda. But it also helps that in, in the event that you have to redeploy your uh, your infrastructure or whatever, you don't have to go into like your clients and change the updated URLs. If you if you're already using a custom domain, then it just like should work. Mm. Oh, uh, whilst you're mentioning Route 53, uh, did you guys ever experiment with like those um, the route policies and that uh, for distributing your your traffic um, between your different ver like if you if you did deploy different versions of your API? Um, uh, no, no, we haven't come across. Uh, I, I've dreamt about it once, you know, doing about it like theoretically, it would be fun. But no, I mean, the closest thing that we have going on with like Route 53 is that it's uh, our web app is that it's like it's hidden behind the, well, not hidden, that we use CloudFront as well for uh, our CDN to basically distribute uh, traffic to the S3 bucket for our front end. Okay. Did yeah. you guys use CloudFront for um, your APIs at all? Like those, uh, the I don't know what they're called now, um, but they basically generate like a CloudFront distribution for your your API gateways, the custom domains and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that we use as well. Do do you guys like? Do you guys ever choose to uh, cache certain requests on on those CloudFronts, or is that too much? Like overhead uh, I, I would draw the default to saying that we have uh, like the requirement hasn't come up or the need hasn't uh, hasn't arisen yet for us to cache um certain requests yet yeah yeah okay super cool though okay cool thanks awesome man. appreciate it uh Lorik, you have another question yeah sorry about that um i just said a Another quick one regarding Elastic uh, or open, your use of open search uh, in particular. Um, I'm curious whether you've had any trouble. Uh, so, so my journey, whilst I think Elastic as a stack is is really cool um, and I, I like it as a product, my my experience with open search has not been a smooth one um, in terms of uh, keeping it performant and keeping the costs bearable. Um, so I'm just wondering if you've had any sort of interesting experiences with it. Okay, yeah, yeah. In Definitely. that regard. Um, so I just want to circle back to like why do we use open search in the first place? So um, we obviously DynamoDB is our primary uh, primary primary uh, DB. So I mean, getting to uh, finding a way to search records like natively from DynamoDB and via API gateways, obviously like not feasible in inverted commas. So open search was like our next best option. So essentially we had no choice but to swallow up the cost. So we just bumped it up on its highest instance because we were like, oh, we're gonna be we're gonna be cheap and you know we don't want to rack up a bull, whatever. And then bloop, it fell over like after day two, essentially. So uh, <laughs> we just like tried to get like one of the highest uh, I can't remember what uh, instance type we're on, but we're on like a pretty high instance that sorts all of that for us out and then also the other issue that we ran into was syncing it so syncing open search with uh, dynamo db so basically uh, we've got uh, dynamo streams uh, dynamo db streams that happen and then as soon as the record is pumped into our loads table it gets sent to it gets sent to open search but i mean the reason why we love it is just from its speed and the, the detail that we can go into in terms of getting uh, data uh, data out of it. So that's sort of been like how we've a managed um, managed cost and making it um, making it performant. The other issue though with the performance is uh, because we were like struggling to get something out into market, we had to uh, we had to sort of um, put our open search URL behind the lambda proxy. So it's sort of slow down our performance mm -hmm. by like a couple milliseconds as opposed to invoking the invoking the um, the open search url uh, directly and making sure all the mm -hmm. correct permissions and everything are, are are configured so i would say if anybody is thinking of um, going the open search uh, open search route, just make sure that you've got a 
a performant way to make sure you've got the correct permission so that you know any uh, client can access because otherwise you're going to go into um, adding IP addresses to whitelist into the security tab uh, panel as well and all that kind of jazz or what we've done like create a, a create a proxy but we have figured out how to do it correctly it's just we haven't had the time to go back go back to it okay no awesome thanks thanks for that Jack. Um, it, it seems to have been a trend um, in 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 how I've seen with with, with uh, people using open search so it's, it's just a curious curiosity of mine now thanks Awesome, awesome. Hey, Darren, another question? Like one or two more questions, and then we get to the closing part. Cool. Uh, sorry, I, I just got a question regarding, because you I heard you mention you used like a proxy and that, um, like, um, was there any decision not to like throw them, your, your lambdas in and your cluster into like a, a VPC? Because um, from the sounds of it, it sounds like it's a, like a public um, open search cluster. Oh no! no. Uh, so so that particular lambda is in the VPC. Yeah. It's oh different. okay. It's in the it is in the VPC stack. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I would, would be without jobs if people knew that we had a open a public open search cluster with people's data in it. No, they get ravished very quickly. <laughs> this certainly wouldn't be the forum to talk about it either. Yeah, and it's recorded as well. So yeah, you know. <laughs> Okay. Uh, is that Perfect. everyone? This was the most questions that we've ever had. That's awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording.